wonderful to see such a, a packed and lively audience and so many, so many media cameras. It's, uh, uh, it's very, very exciting to have you all here. It's my pleasure as the Dean of the Business School at the George Washington University uh, to welcome you on behalf of the Business School and on behalf of the university as a whole. When I took over as the, the Dean of the Business School here about nine months ago now, uh, I had a vision, an idea of really building a business school that leveraged its position within this city in a way that allowed us to deliver a rich dialogue amongst students, faculty, professionals, uh, that was really about the intersection of business and public policy and really meant that we were going to bring together the top people in this city to talk about the future of the global economy. Uh, we had a nice run up to this event last week and it was an exciting uh, couple of days here and we're back here again with an even more exciting event. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, overview of what's going to happen today, um, our speaker is going to speak for about 30 minutes uh, and then we're going to have about 25 minutes of question and answer that's going to be facilitated by our own uh, professor of international business, Danny Leipzinger. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, please, please join me in welcoming President Steve Knapp to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Dean Guthrie. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to George Washington University. Uh, here in Foggy Bottom, our home for nearly 100 years for this part of our university, we enjoy the privilege of being surrounded by some of the most important institutions in the world, and we're especially honored to include among our neighbors the International Monetary Fund. I think the dean has already touched on the fact that our ability to partner with our neighbors is one of the real strategic advantages of a university located in the heart of our nation's capital. Their proximity to each other has allowed our two institutions to enjoy a close working relationship in a number of areas. IMF staff members regularly teach courses and serve as guest lecturers in programs across the university. Many of George Washington's institutes and sponsors, and schools rather, co-sponsor events with the IMF, and our faculty and students frequently collaborate with IMF staff. So it's a distinct pleasure to welcome the IMF's 10th Managing Director, Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Before assuming his current position, he served in the French National Academy and held several distinguished positions in the French government and was a professor of economics at the University of Paris and the Institut d'études politiques, otherwise known as Sciences Po. Dr. Strauss-Kahn's address is entitled Global Challenges, Global Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Thank you, thank you very much. First, good afternoon. I come here as a, as a neighbor, and uh, it's a real pleasure. We often say that beginning a speech, but in this case, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, introduced by Dean Guthrie, and I really want to thank President Knapp for having made this possible, and Danny, Danny Leipziger for organizing this, uh, this event. I, I say it's a pleasure because um, I really enjoy uh, speaking to students. You just uh, mentioned that uh, previously I have been for a long time a uh, university professor, and I did this during my tenure in the IMF in many places, from Seoul to Kinshasa, from Lima to Cambridge in the UK. So finally, it looks a bit a pity uh, having done this everywhere, but not in Washington. And uh, where, what other places, what other place than Washington University to, to do it nicely. So thank you again for uh, inviting me. Next week, as you may know, the IMF and the World Bank will have uh, what we call our spring meetings. We have meetings of this kind twice a, a year, but uh, uh, the, 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 the fall meeting is probably more important. The spring meeting is just in between. And it's a moment where most uh, finance ministers and governors of central banks we are accountable to are coming to Washington to discuss the state of the world and what kind of a decision have to be, to be made. And this time, 
we will have a lot to talk about because uh, really we're living a very special moment in uh, economic uh, history. Uh, why? Certainly because the financial crisis has devastated the global economy. Everybody knows this, um, causing uh, suffering all over the world. But that's not the only reason. Because the crisis did more. And the crisis also devastated the whole intellectual foundation of uh, the global economic order of the last quarter century. Basically, before the crisis, we thought, we economists, we, we thought that uh, the economists thought that uh, we knew how to manage economies, both advanced economies, emerging economies, low income. Uh, we knew to, well, what was the right thing to do. And the so-called Washington Consensus that you certainly heard about uh, was, uh, had a number of basic mantras. One was um, that simple rules for monetary and fiscal policy uh, would guarantee stability. Another mantra was that deregulation and privatization would unleash growth and prosperity. And a third one, but the list could go on and on, was that the financial market would correctly channel the routes to the resources where needed, and at the same time, that they will be able to uh, police themselves very effectively. And so, the rising tide of globalization would lift all boats. That was the dream before. I say it with some humility, because certainly myself, as many others, we took part of it. Some were more, had more criticism than others, but nevertheless, that's what the, the broader idea. And this came, this all came crashing down uh, with the crisis, and clearly, the Washington consensus is behind us. What's the task before us? It's to rebuild the foundation of stability and make the next phase of globalization uh, work for all. And I think that uh, this rebuilding has three core areas. The first one has to do with a new approach to economic policy. The second, with a new approach to social inclusion. And the third one has to do with a new approach to cooperation and multilateralism. But before I come to the three points, let me just say a few words about uh, the economic situation and the state of the world. As we all know, the global economic recovery is going on. But the problem is that it's very much in balance, more than it has ever been. And it's in balance in two different ways. It's in balance between countries, and it's in balance within countries. And that two kind of problems that may uh, undermine this uh, recovery. In advanced economies, the, what is the problem? US, Japan, the European countries. The problem is that there are some growth, but still too low and especially too low to see unemployment going dramatically down. The recent figures in the US are rather encouraging. It's not the case in Europe and Japan, of course, in a special situation with the recent uh, tragedy. So this part of the world is not as bad uh, in a situation which is not as bad as uh, two years ago, certainly not. Re the growth is coming back, but still, uh, the recovery is sluggish. Now, when you look at most emerging market economies, in Asia especially, in Latin America, but also elsewhere, then it's totally a different figure. And uh, they're, they're powering ahead. And even now, these days, since the beginning of this year, the question is not growth. The question is overheating. They're almost all of them reaching their growth potential. And the question is, how can they go on and will it last long enough without uh, surge in inflation and new problem arising for growth, which is too high? So that's the imbalance between countries. Of course, you still have the um, third category of countries, 
the low-income countries, mostly in Africa, some in Central America, some in Asia, that on one hand has proved remarkably resilient during the crisis, much more than during previous crises, but still now being hit by the new food and fuel uh, prices uh, increase. It was already the case in 2008, you may remember this, uh, then uh, the prices went down with, of course, the slowdown in the global economy. Now, there's a new hike in prices, and of course, those, has, those who are the most hit by uh, this kind of things are the, the people in, in the low-income low countries. So very different situation around the world, and the, all the average figures were expecting something which was around 4.5 uh, percent of growth for this year. This average is hiding huge differences, depending on the part of the world you're looking uh, at. So, great uncertainty is prevailing with, uh, well, a number of black swan uh, swimming in the global economy lake. Of course, the first thing which comes to my mind is a tragedy in Japan, uh, where the priority is certainly to alleviate uh, the human suffering. But then, immediately after, the question will be the rebuilding of a large part of the Japanese uh, economy, which has been destroyed. We all have been impressed by the resilience of the Japanese people, but whatever this resilience, the fact that a part of the economy has been destroyed may need some special effort after this crisis, and we're still not exactly in the aftermath of the crisis. We're still hesitating, depending on what may happen on the, on the nuclear side, of course. But Beyond Japan and more for a longer time, the question of European countries is certainly a, 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 an important one. Some of these countries are at crossroads uh, because of sovereign debt problems, uh, because of financial sector problem. There, most of them, you have heard about Greece, you've heard about Ireland, there may be some others. Um, most of them, of these countries, have done huge efforts to try to stabilize their situation at a very high cost for their population, but still, the future is uncertain. And without any kind of a comprehensive solution uh, built or proposed by the European Union, especially by the Eurozone, I'm afraid that uh, it will be difficult to find a solution. And this comprehensive solution has to be based on a pan-European solidarity, because those countries sharing the same currency must have more solidarity within them than uh, uh, other countries in, in the world, of course. Some progress have been made, but they're still partial, and so I'm still worried about the possibility for Europe to have high growth in the coming uh, five years or, or six years. And then, Japan, Europe, you have a third kind of concern for the last period during the last, the last months, which has to do with the Middle East and North Africa. On one hand, of course, it's good news. And uh, this part of the world is going through historic transformation. Um, the citizens are seeking uh, greater freedom and a fairer distribution of uh, economic opportunities and resources, who can be against that? Nobody, of course. We're all in favor. But this will require far-reaching changes in political, economic, and social institutions. And those changes take time. So the question is, what's going to happen between the transition? How can we help them? Is it going to be that easy? And probably not. Uh, the immediate challenge uh, view from the IMF is that, uh, on one hand, the new governments need to uh, preserve social cohesion, and at the same time, they need to avoid undermining macroeconomic stability. And quite understandably, those governments have uh, begun with, uh, in a time of social unrest, it's quite understandable from uh, those governments. They have begun with uh, uh, absorbing part of the increase in food and uh, fuel prices to avoid this to hit too hardly the population at very high cost uh, 
for the government budgets. So the question for us now is how can we help them to avoid to create more problem for tomorrow because the new kind of democracy that they may try to put in place, of course, will be challenged by any kind of economic uh, uh, collapse and the social unrest that may follow. So the international community is certainly ready to help, uh, but it's going to be a long process. We, have, we need to help now, and we certainly need to help also in the, in the year to come. Not to talk about other conflicts, especially in Africa. Uh, think about Côte d'Ivoire, for instance, where you have a civil conflict, a humanitarian crisis, millions of refugees, and that also may be a big threat for what is the, the, the powerhouse of the, 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 the region. So, bottom line, we're certainly in the wake of the crisis, but the crisis is not over. Uh, the recovery is still fragile and it's very uneven, and we shouldn't uh, rejoice too early because uh, we, a lot of downside risks are still uh, existing, and uh, we try to address them one after the other one. Still, those risks are important, and nobody can say today as long as unemployment is not decreasing everywhere, as long as inequalities are still increasing, nobody can say really that the crisis is behind us. So now, what's the other legacy of this crisis? And as I said, I see three domains in which we need to renew uh, the, 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 the view, the analysis uh, that we had before. The first has to do with macroeconomic policy. What was the old paradigm? The old paradigm was that uh, all what monetary policy has to care about was inflation and growth. Obviously, it was a bit too simple. And great danger lurked behind uh, this facade of uh, low inflation and, and strong growth. You have the question of uh, soaring uh, asset prices, you have the question of booming uh, credit growth. You have the problem of investment biased through uh, toward housing. You can have a long list of problems of the, of the kind, which are not only inflation and only growth. All see a, a financial crossable of uh, toxic assets, large current account imbalances. And so the question is, this idea that all what has to be done with monetary policy is to adapt the interest rate in the right way, and if you have a rule to do it, then it's fine, and then you have the right policy in place, obviously was uh, far too simple to deal with a financial reality, which is much more complex than it was even 10 years, or even more, 20 years ago. If you turn to the financial sector, same thing. In the old days, this financial sector was too often ignored, as if the financial sector was a sector as another one, as housing, as uh, motor cars. You know, finance, uh, financial services were seen, were seen as just one kind of service among others. So the financial regulation and supervision was narrowly looking at institutions and market individually. Look, trying to see if this institution was working well or not. But the systemic effect of the financial sector was largely ignored, and this, it is this systemic effect of the financial sector which is exactly at the roots, well, I won't say at the roots of this crisis, but the reason why the crisis became a global crisis. So the key lesson of this is that local events in the financial sector may have global repercussions, which is not the case for local events in the real economy. And that's certainly one of the big differences between what is uh, Main Street and Wall Street, the, the real sector and the financial sector. So globally, monetary policy must now go beyond the question of price stability and look at financial stability, which is much more complex, much broader. It's not only a question of policy rate, it's a question of using many other tools macroprudential instruments, capital ratios, liquidity ratio, loan to value ratio, and we need to learn, I say this with humility, because we're far from understanding clearly everything which is happening. So we need to learn more how, uh, 
how to design and how to use these tools. That's a huge field for academics, uh, for future PhDs. Uh, the traditional work on uh, the Taylor rule and interest rate is probably part of history. I'm not saying it's not interesting anymore, but there's so many things that needs now to be studied in the academia that uh, many other topics will be probably more important and attract more attention in the coming years than what has been traditionally done during the last 20 years. Now, what about fiscal policy? Again, under the old paradigm, fiscal policy was uh, the kind of, a, I would say, the neglected child of the policy family. Um, what was the role? Well, it was mostly limited to uh, automatic stabilizer, meaning that uh, we had to let the fiscal policy work with the cycle, not more than that. What we call discretionary fiscal policy was really regarded with uh, a deep uh, suspicion. Now, the crisis came. And with the monetary policy uh, running out of steam, then the need, and, and also the financial sector obviously on its needs, and so the possibility of expansion in credit totally uh, out, of the, of the, of the, out of the table, then the need of some support of aggregate demand appears clearly. And I'm proud to say that the IMF was probably the first institution asking as early as January 2008 for this uh, stimulus, which will be uh, a support to aggregate demand because we needed this to avoid a crisis that could have been as severe as the Great Depression. Remember, remember, two and a half years ago, many, many among you, maybe two and a half years ago, you were too young, but uh, your professors, were uh, scared, rightly, by the possibility of a crisis as deep as the Great Depression. We didn't have that. We had a crisis, terrible, with a lot of uh, terrible consequences, but not something which looks like uh, 1929. Why? Especially because this stimulus put in place everywhere and all countries having some fiscal room supported the demand and finally limited the downturn in, in uh, in uh, economic growth. So I really think that uh, this uh, uh, boost in aggregate demand saved the world from uh, an economic uh, freefall. What does that mean? It means that we need also to rethink the use of fiscal policy. I said already a word about the financial sector. Uh, well, still in need of major surgery. crisis originated not very far from here. History will uh, remind us in textbook that uh, the crisis originated in the housing market in Maryland. Is it true or not? I don't know, but you always have this kind of legend. So, uh, but what is true is that it originated in the housing market in the US and because of a culture of uh, reckless uh, risk taking which I must say, I'm sorry about that, but the culture which is uh, still alive, which has a bit disappeared uh, during the crisis, at the climax of the crisis, but finally, who's now, uh, which is now uh, coming, coming back. Not to say that uh, no positive steps has been made since uh, the crisis, uh, you all have heard about uh, Basel III and the new rules in terms of regulation and capital requirements, uh, but we need much more than that. We need to have the regulation going beyond the traditional banking sector to what we call the shadow banking sector, let's say hedge funds and all this kind of institutions. We need supervision at least as much as regulation, because you may have the best, rule, the best rule you want in the world if they're not supervised, it's as if you had nothing. And the crisis that we had was uh, probably more a crisis of bad supervision than even a crisis of bad regulation. We need cross-border resolution mechanism that we still don't have. And when the IMF 
has been involved in this crisis trying to help countries, one of the big problems we found was that the, the system is such now that big banks, the, the so-called uh, too large to fail, uh, or I prefer to say too important to fail, because sometimes they're not that large, but they're very important, uh, banks or institution, where institution operating cross-border. So the question was not to deal with the problem in one country or another country, but to be able to uh, have a look and a view on the total activity of the, of the institution. We certainly need, as I just mentioned, uh, a resolution mechanism to end the scourge of uh, too important to fail. And on top of that, and it may surprise some of you, having heard of uh, the old IMF, we certainly need, and that's what uh, the IMF has proposed to the G20 uh, almost one year ago in Toronto, we certainly need a tax on financial activities. So there's a different way to define this tax. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but the idea is very simple. The idea is the financial sector has to take risk. But on the other hand, that's his role. But on the other hand, uh, we should limit risk, which when they are profitable goes only in the pocket of those taking the risk, but when they have losses are paid by everybody and all the taxpayers. So what's the way to do this? And the way to avoid this is to curb the risk-taking behavior of by this kind of tax, at the same time providing resources, kind of a insurance premium that could be used to feed a fund that will be helpful in case of catastrophe as opposed to ask the money to the taxpayer. So we are proposing something in this direction. In fact, for technical reasons, we're proposing two different kinds of taxes. Uh, I must tell you that the success so far has been limited, but I still believe that it's something that needs to be put in place and maybe in the future it will, it will happen. So from this question on macroeconomic, I would just like to draw two broad conclusions. Two changes. The pendulum will swing at least a little from the market to the state and from relatively simple solution to a much more complex solution. And that's the two main direction in which I see economic theory working for the coming, uh, let's say, uh, 10 years. Nobody knows what's going to happen afterwards. After this new approach to economic, macroeconomic theory, we certainly need a new approach to uh, uh, social inclusion. Don't, don't get me wrong. Globalization has delivered a lot and has lifted millions, tens of millions, hundreds of million people around the world out of poverty. But it has also a dark side. And the dark side is a large and growing chasm between the rich and the poor, which was seen, always the old paradigm, as, you know, well, it's unavoidable. You have to pay this because for growth and for having uh, the average being better off, you have to accept this increase in inequality. And not a lot of attention was paid to this uh, problem. Partly because, and that's something I want to uh, underline, partly because this kind of inequality didn't appear so much at the beginning when globalization was trade globalization. But it appears in the second stage when globalization becomes financial globalization. And the financial globalization bring with it this kind of new uh, inequalities. The tendency, as I just say, was to downplay inequality. But uh, the crisis has uh, fundamentally changed uh, our perceptions. There's a kind of lethal uh, cocktail of uh, prolonged unemployment and high inequality, which leads to social unrest, and with social unrest to a uh, threat to a political stability and also to macroeconomic uh, stability. But what you have to keep in mind is that inequality may, be, may have been one of the silent uh, causes of the crisis. What is really striking 
is something that you all know, but I like to uh, remind it to you, is that uh, income inequality, as measured in the United States as the share of the 10%, um, the, the, the first 10% uh, of the income distribution, dramatically went down after the crisis of uh, the, the Great Depression in, uh, in, in, in the 30s, stayed rather low, the share was about 30% of total income, until the beginning of the 90s, and started to increase again, to reach almost exactly the same level at the, uh, at the onset of this crisis that the level was what reached in 1929. Why is it so? What's the link between inequalities and this the kind of crisis that we have? It's very easy to understand. The reality is those kinds of inequality made the middle classes and even the poorer classes in different societies, not only in the US, same thing for Europe, same thing for other countries, made these people having a real problem of purchasing power. And the only way to avoid to have uh, to see his own purchasing power decreasing was borrowing. And so everybody was happy. The financial sector was happy to increase its market share in developing credit. Credit has been given to people who were not always able to repay or were able to repay in a stable situation but will be very fragile to any kind of external shock. And so the mechanism put in place was low increase in wages but compensated by a large possibility of borrowing. Of course, this leads to the kind of crisis that uh, uh, we had. So it's clear now for many uh, that sustainable growth in the long term has to rely on a more equal, equal income uh, distribution, and that inequality makes countries more uh, prone to adverse shock, that it reduces trust of the population in the institution that in Anchorage instability and all these kind of things are a totally new approach to the growth theory that the one we had before which was probably a bit uh, sim too simple. Clearly we need a new form of globalization, a fairer form, a globalization with more a human face. You all heard about the in invisible hand uh, I, I like to say that uh, the in invisible hand uh, must not become the invisible fist. And that's really the question we have to face in, in the coming years. And then the third point, after macroeconomic theory and after social inclusion, the third one has to do with uh, some remark, I will be short on this, on uh, multilateralism. The crisis has taught us a lot of lessons Probably the greatest lesson is that cooperation is non-negotiable non for, for stability. I just say that we avoided something which could have been as uh, dramatic as the, the Great Depression. A large part of the merit, well, a large part of the merit comes to, to, to the IMF, but besides the IMF, a large part of the merit comes to the G20. Because this G20, you know, this group of the 20's biggest economies, the G20 was a, has been able to work together. And cooperation was really the, the word of the day during the end of 2009, 2000, uh, 2008, 2000, year 2009, and even the beginning of 2010. The reason was mostly that the head of state was so scared that nobody wanted to follow its own route and everybody wants to be in the, in the tribe. But sometimes fear is a good incentive to go in the right direction. So working together, putting in place the stimulus everywhere where it was possible together, trying to put new kind of rules in the financial sector together, having the right monetary policy put in place everywhere, providing the liquidity, to the, to the banks everywhere in all the countries. And this being done in a coordinated way was certainly the reason why we avoided this possible uh, collapse of the, of the global economy. The question now is, of course, that uh, in the aftermath of the crisis, the momentum for cooperation is not as strong as it was before. And 
for understandable and understandable reasons. Governments are coming back home, they have their own domestic political problem, they want to deal with their own problem, and they forget a little about the need for cooperation. And there's a tendency, I won't say we're totally back to a pre-crisis situation, it would be unfair. But the momentum, the willingness to work together, still there, but not as strong as it has been two years ago. And that's a bit worry for me, because a cooperation is obviously something that we need crisis or in the wake of the crisis, because we're in such a globalized world that there is no domestic solution to global problems. And that's why certainly um, multilateral institutions, not only the IMF, the World Bank, some others, well, I don't see many others, but at least the IMF and the World Bank, uh, will become, in my view, more and more important. The World Bank for development and project financing, the IMF for uh, macroeconomic environment and uh, economic uh, policy. But of course, to become more important as the place where this multilateral coordination can take place, they need to adapt themselves. It cannot be the same institution that the institution they were 10 years ago. The IMF has made many changes. We have renewed, well, almost everything. Uh, the early warning, system that we had was obviously fluid. It's always very difficult to predict a crisis. You know, crisis is a bit like earthquake. You may say there is a risk of earthquake in this part of the world. You never know exactly when, uh, even if, the earthquake will take place. It's a bit the same thing for crisis. So we were able in the IMF to say that there were some vulnerabilities in this sector, this sector. But of course, we didn't say uh, a crisis will come and uh, at this time in, in, this, in this field. Some, some uh, academic fellows did. They had a very uh, secure way to do it. They are saying on and on for 10 years that a crisis will come. So one day, they're right. <laughs> uh, we, we can't do exactly at that way. And so we have been fairly enough criticized for not having a system in place which shows enough the vulnerability. So we have renewed totally our early, uh, our early warning uh, exercise. Uh, we have uh, created new kind of reports. We call this spillover report. What that? It comes from the fact that the IMF, as you know, founded in 1944 in, in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, uh, had the basic idea of a kind of surveillance by the IMF on the country's members of the institution. And now we have 187 member in, the, in member countries. But it's defined or designed as a bilateral surveillance. The IMF is having a look on the, what's going on in the country and say the country and the world, but mostly the country, well, what you're doing is good, not that good. You should go faster than this or, or, or slow down on that. Good. But bilateral surveillance is not enough. We need multilateral civilians. What does that mean? It means that in globalization, in the globalization, the economic policy put in place by some countries, the most important one, the most systemic one, have consequences on others. So you should not only have a look on the way whether or not, you know, whether or not the policy is appropriate for the country itself, but also what kind of spillover it may have on the rest of the world. And so we are in uh, just uh, the first round of this and ex an experience that we are working on five spillover reports, one for the US, of course, one for China, one for the Eurozone, one for UK, and one for Japan, just to look at the consequences of what they're doing on the rest of the world. Very well-known problem, of course, is the consequences of a QE2 on the liquidity in the rest of the world, and is it linked or not to the huge capital inflows that uh, most emerging countries are just experiencing. So this kind of thing is totally new, and of course it's adapting the institution to the new state of the world. Uh, many other things, let me go fast on this. Uh, we have a financial uh, sector uh, assessment program, which is deep study of the financial sector. Until now it was uh, not mandatory, so our country may ask the IMF to do it and accept for the IMF to do it or not. 
Now it becomes mandatory, it has become mandatory for the 20 big, a little more than the 20 big economies. Uh, surprisingly enough, two countries had refused before the crisis this kind of FSAP, we call them, uh, China and the US. Uh, I'm not saying that if there had been an FSAP before 2007 in the US, we will absolutely be sure to, to find and to avoid the crisis. I'm not saying this. But at least, if you don't have in-depth analysis, you have no chance to be able to know what's going wrong. So now all this is becoming mandatory, and certainly it will increase the knowledge of the vulnerabilities and make it possible to, uh, to fix this. Same thing, I would say, on monitoring the, the capital flows. Same thing on a very important exercise, which is made by the G20, but technically done by the IMF, what we call the MAP, the Mutual Assessment Program, which is basically taking all the forecasts and the policies the different countries, the 20 big countries have in place, well, how they see themselves the coming two or three years, we put all together and we tell them it's interesting, but it doesn't fit. Or it goes together, but the result is not that good and you could do better. And if everybody is doing his own work, then uh, everybody can be better off. So the question is not only to try to, you know, it's kind of a cooperative game. You cannot only do what you believe is best for you because what maybe doesn't appear to you as being best for you at the first stage will become best for you if everybody does the right thing. And that's obviously the case for the global imbalances problem. So there are many other things like this which have totally renew the institution, but it's not enough. And that's my last point, which is that multilateralism has to go with globalization, but multilateralism needs a legitimate institution. And the legitimacy of an institution like the IMF has been at stake because it's true to say that uh, it's an institu institution which is based on uh, voting power and shares. We call that quotas. Quotas are supposed to reflect the size of the different economy, more or less. And it wasn't the case. It wasn't the case because the emerging markets have grown and grown during the last 10 years, even more, and their share their voting power, their voice in the institution had an increase in the same at the same pace. So two reforms, one in 2008, a second one just being uh, uh, completed recently, will shift altogether almost 10% of the voting power to uh, emerging, dynamic emerging uh, economies coming from advanced economies, of course. And this rebalanced more or less, nothing is perfect, but more or less now, the the voices in the IMF are in line with the, the size of the different economy in the world. I, just an example of this, the 10 biggest shareholders, it's not really shareholders, but uh, the 10 biggest quotas in the fund will be, as soon as the reform will be implemented, which is a question of months because of a legalistic process, um, the US and Japan, the four BRICs, China, India, Brazil, and Russia, and the four big Europeans, UK, France, Germany, and Italy, which is exactly the state of the world. But it wasn't the case before. So this question of legitimacy is absolutely uh, uh, crucial, even if legitimacy is not only a question of quota, it's also a question of uh, diversity of people being in the IMF, coming from the different part of the world. So we have more to do. So it's time, yeah, more than time, sorry, to conclude. My conclusion is a very simple one. The challenge we're facing is a huge challenge. And the result of what we can do all together will have a lot of consequences on the state of the world in the coming decades, on your life. It's not a new challenge, surprisingly enough. If we go back to 1933, Keynes, who was, as you know, one of the founding fathers of the IMF, and his colleagues at this time, were facing almost the same kind of uh, challenges, different times, different environment, but the same kind of thing, which is the balance between nations wanting to have their sovereignty, their own policy, and 
the need of cooperation at a global level. That's why the IMF has been built, to try to avoid, in the terms of the period of, the, of this time, which are different from the terms of, this, of today, of course, but to try to avoid that a damage created by one country will have terrible consequences on, 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 on the rest of, of the world. So this idea is really that common good has to prevail and that the only way to do this is to have institution that may organize the, the, the cooperation. That's why the IMF has a key role to play in, in the coming uh, years, which basically is to reconnect with the original mission, uh, promote cooperation, fight against uh, economic war, because economic war very often ends with war uh, as a uh, civil war or uh, external war. And we have a lot of examples where economic troubles uh, created a social unrest, threat to democracy, and finally threat to, to, to peace. It's not a surprise that institutions like the IMF or the World Bank have been in some respect linked to the UN because it's part of the uh, peace building process to try to have a global economy which, uh, which works. So you're here in uh, one of the best universities in the world. Many of you are future leaders. And so you have to ask yourself very simply, in what kind of world do I want to live in the coming decade? And in what kind of world do I want to have a family, to have kids? In what kind of world do I want this kid to live in? And surely you will answer, I want a world which is more intelligent, more just, more virtuous, more cooperative, where everybody has to be proud of his own countries, but where nationalistic view will be set aside. And this is exactly the essence of multilateralism and the reason why an institution like the IMF has been founded. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to answer your question. The managing director has uh, kindly agreed to take a few questions. Uh, we're going to give priority to students um, uh, rather than professional uh, uh, attendees. Um, it's hard to see. OK. OK. Um, hi, my name is Everton. I'm an MBA student, full time here at George Washington. Thanks, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, my question is, is related to what you said in your talk about uh, the new goals of, macro, of uh, monetary policy that goes towards financial stability. And uh, I would like to hear specifically in w about one of the tools that uh, Brazil is adopting for controlling uh, short-term capital flows. So they're basically increasing taxes to avoid short-term capital, capital flows, and you're using this to try to stabilize your country. I would like to see uh, your perspectives on, on how effective these type of measures are. During decades, the mantra, one of the mantra I was referring to previously, was this idea that the capital flows are always good, and so they shouldn't in any way be limited. And it's true to say that in most cases, capital flows are welcome, because that's the way to finance uh, uh, investment. And it's just good for the global economy that capital will flow from places where the reward are smaller than to places where the reward are higher, because that's where you need to invest, because that's where you have more efficiency for the global economy. So, in general, capital flows have to flow freely. Now, what happens? It happens that sometimes you are contemplating surge in capital flows that can totally derail your economic policy, and that's what we are seeing these times. Uh, the reason why those capital flows are so important is another problem. I'm uh, happy to answer a question on this if you want. But the reality is this. And the point is that some countries have put in place, let's call it capital controls, to uh, make it simple, different kind of tools, taxes, or so, to try to limit these inflows. So what do we think about that? I think we should have a very pragmatic view. When 
capital flows are just a regular flow coming from the fact that people are expecting higher returns in this country because the rate of growth is big, then it's fine. Then it has to lead to the natural consequences of this, which is the revaluation of your currency, because your economy is becoming stronger and stronger. So the first measure to take to avoid too big capital inflows is to have the currency floating freely and appreciating when you have this kind of thing. But it may happen that your currency is floating freely, that it has the correct value. Uh, you don't want on the other way, you don't want to be undervalued, but you have no reason to want it overvalued, and so you have no possibility to act that way. Then you have a second line of defense, which is to say, okay, let's accumulate reserves and then you have to sterilize it to avoid this reserve to create problem to your domestic monetary policy. But all this has also a limit because you may have been accumulating an adequate amount of reserves and that's money which, as I say, is sterilized so you're not going to accumulate forever. So after one, at one point in time, you have the correct reserves and you, could not, you cannot go very much further. And we can go on and on with this, with all the different elements of economic policy, and you have to fix the different elements of this economic policy so that finally the, the inflows will, which were, in this case, in my hypothesis, originated by wrong or loopholes in your economic policy, will be fixed. But at the end, you may have the right policy in place, but just because you have high prospect of growth, you have real surge, and then it can just derail all your, uh, your, your economy. Then, frankly, I can understand countries saying, we need to do something. We cannot just stay uh, like this, inactive. And uh, then they put in place, certainly for a small period of time, uh, the kind of capital controls we're talking about. Is it effective? We did a lot of study on this. Sometimes yes, sometimes not that much. It doesn't solve the basic economic problem. So it cannot be a substitute to the right economic policy. But when the right economic policy is in place, then it can be necessary for a temporary, on a temporary basis to use this kind of thing. That's why I said it has to be a pragmatic view and not you know, a kind of ideological view saying never, uh, certainly, we're certainly not in this mood today. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, in a no way uh, this kind of capital controls can be seen as a kind of a, you know, a silver bullet that will solve all the problems. The problem are structural problems that have to be addressed. Hi, thank you again. I'm Konica Metre. I'm a second year Master of Public Administration student. Um, I, I understand your focus on, on cooperation. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I was wondering, in terms of at, at the IMF, uh, emphasizing integration uh, for Europe and also tackling unemployment, whether labor integration fits into that, and if so, how? Well, the cooperation between, uh, if, if I understood well your question, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, the cooperation we have with Europe uh, has, uh, is a kind of a special thing for us because usually we're working with, uh, with countries and for the first time we're dealing with uh, some strange animal which is uh, the European Union or the Eurozone. Um, well, I won't say it's so helpful, but uh, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> Now the question is that uh, a lot of things has to be done in Europe uh, that was uh, previously already listed by uh, the different uh, analysis that the IMF did on the different countries, it be Germany, UK, uh, Italy, France, or small countries, not exactly the same thing in the different countries, but finally Europe is rather homogeneous and so looks uh, uh, there are a lot of differences when you're inside you only see the differences between the Brits and the French and the German and the Italian when you're outside by Europeans. And, and they have the same kind of problems. Uh, labor market, certainly, and structural reform on the labor market. Uh, rigidity in the economy, more in some economies than others. And again, there has to be a nuance, a lot of nuances, but nevertheless. Uh, so 
different kind of, of reforms uh, have to be put in place, which may be the way to avoid the sluggish recovery they're uh, experiencing now and the risk of a rather long period of, of, of slow growth. But what is important, and that's why maybe this reason why you started with the, the emphasis I put on cooperation, is that uh, this crisis has really been a test for the European system, and I won't say such a successful test, because uh, the governance of the system worked well uh, in quiet times. But when the crisis came, well, in the crisis itself, at the apex of the crisis, as everybody, as I said, everybody wanted to work together, it was OK. But just after the crisis, where we're now, um, the governance appears to be, let's say, a bit heavy. And uh, making the decision-making process a bit long. Uh, sometime uh, that long that we're still expecting the result. And uh, so in many cases in Europe, the problem that has to be solved is that those countries, and I have been one of the founders of the Euro, I was finance minister in my country when the Euro has been created. So in no way I'm saying that uh, uh, it was a wrong move on the contrary, but this move to create the euro and having uh, 12, 11 countries at the beginning, uh, uh, now five more uh, together, this act means that you can't just create a, a, a single currency and then say, well, the job is done, it's over. It's the start, the, 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 the beginning of a process. And it has to go on more and more in terms of economic cooperation and economic integration. And this question of having a single currency but very different economic policy in a different part of the Eurozone is exactly at the root of the crisis that uh, we are contemplating this time in Greece, for instance, in Ireland, where we have program in other countries. Uh, I don't want to make a long list. But uh, so the question of cooperation uh, Europe is a very good example for this because on one hand it's the most developed example of economic cooperation that we ever had and of economic integration. On the other hand, it's the best example of uh, uncompleted uh, economic integration and the need for going forward is certainly what is the most important today for European countries. No, I'll try to be short. Sure. That's my fault. Thank you for taking our questions. I'm, uh, my, my name is Hannes Gravitz. I'm uh, a graduate uh, student in the legal management of the Deutsche Bank University. Uh, even if my field is not uh, relevant to the economic issues, I'm relevant because it's my country situation. I'm from Greece. And you know that Greece is under the age of high America. I heard about it, yeah. Quickly. First, <laughs> directly linked to the previous question, the situation in Greece would certainly have been better if the European Union and the IMF together would have been able to uh, help Greece earlier than what we did. But for governance problem, political problem within the European Union, it, it took more time than necessary. And of course, the later you do what you have to do, the worse it is. The worse it is, on the financial side, but especially, that's my second point, the worst it is for the people. And what the Greek people are experiencing these days is very difficult. 
And uh, when I see uh, that there uh, are some demonstration in the street, a reaction, I just come, I just understand this because it's very difficult for the people in the street and the man in the street to accept this idea that it has to make huge efforts because many governments during a long period of time have just uh, failed and not put in place the, 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 the right policy. So it's very hard. Why is it so hard? Partly because Greece is part of the Eurozone, uh, which has bring Greece a lot of good things, but also has one drawback, which is that uh, the, the currency cannot be used as a policy tool. And so they have to do all what they have to do without changing the value of the currency, which makes it even more difficult. Of course, that's the counterpart of the lot of things that being a member of the Eurozone has bring to Greece. But at the right, at this moment, it's more a problem than something, than something else. Now, what are the two problems that Greece is facing? The size of the public debt and the competitivity problem. As far as the size of the problem deck is concerned, that's what, where your question was pointing. Uh, the program which has been designed by the European and by the with IMF tries to put back Greece on tracks as soon as possible without the need of any kind of default. And I know that recently in the press it has been written that uh, the IMF was in favor of uh, different kind of uh, uh, change in this policy. I want to deny this. We are supporting the Greek government in his position that he doesn't want a restructuration of the debt. But your question was, why and what would be the effect? The reason is very simple. That in no way this do solve the competitiveness problem. And the competitiveness problem is the real thing that you have to solve. Let me give you just one figure. Since the beginning of the euro, 12 years ago, average increase in uh, public sector wages has been, in nominal terms, 35% as an average for the eurozone. Some countries below, some others. Most countries between 30 and 40. Germany, 17. So they won a lot of competitivity, no surprise. Greece, 100. So the question of competitivity has to be addressed. You can't avoid it. And that has nothing to do with the debt. It has to do with the competitivity of the Greek economy because there is no other way to finally succeed in having the debt ratio decreasing than growth. So you have to restore growth in Greece, and to restore growth in Greece, you have to restore competitiveness. So that's the real problem, and that's what we try to address. I think we'll take one last uh, question from this side. You seem eager. <laughs> I'll pass this back. Please, give me the Please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Danny Silverstein. I'm a senior in, in DW. I had a question regarding environmental uh, environmentalism. Um, so recently, a lot of organizations worldwide have taken a turn towards economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Um, I wanted to know the IMF, uh, what, what are their initiatives, considering that they do impose uh, some uh, policy changes when they, when they want um, countries to qualify for their loans. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good point. Many, many have argued and still arguing that it's none of our business because the IMF has a task, which is a short-term task, which is to restore the economic environment and put countries who have problems for whatever the reason of the problems back on track so that it's a three years, four years problem and that's what we have to do. And the other business, the long-term business, was the World Bank problem, you know, with two sister institutions. So education, health, environment, was question for the World Bank, not for the IMF. My view is that's a bit too simple again. And that in many respects, we have also to deal with this question. You, it's impossible to say that's one of the biggest threats for mankind in the coming uh, century. 
and say, okay, you're the most important uh, multilateral organization and you just uh, stay away from this. So we have two ways, or we use two ways to try to uh, be in this debate and try to help. The first one, for a rather long time, which is the, our fiscal department working on carbon tax and trying to develop the way a carbon tax should work and can work, and we have very, very strong supporters of implementing this kind of, of taxes. It's difficult, has a lot of problems. I'm not uh, going into the nitty-gritty of it, but the reality is that uh, for a long time the fund has been uh, on this side. The second thing is more recent, and after the failure, if I may say so, of Copenhagen, which came mostly from the lack of financing and the impossibility to find a way to produce this 100 billion a year that we're asked, following the expert, we're not expert in the environment, we're expert in finance, not in the environment. So I take the figure from outside. They say there's kind of consensus about this idea of 100 billion dollars. So the question is who is going to pay? And everybody went home saying, not me. And so nothing happened. So we proposed something, which again hasn't been accepted so far at the, the, by uh, the global level, which basically is based on uh, the special drawing rights that the, the fund is likely to uh, issue, uh, which has been useful during this crisis to provide liquidity to countries, which may help to the global international system as a, as a quasi-currency, not a currency, but something that could be used as a currency. Based on this, we built kind of cathedral, and some has told us it's too big a cathedral and it will collapse, but okay. That was able to provide this 100 billion a year to finance uh, environmental question, both mitigating the climate change problem and helping countries to develop new kind of green energy and, and, and green growth. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that uh, we had some success, for instance, uh, uh, some NGOs like one or others said it's a good idea. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, which, who is uh, very much uh, engaged in this, uh, says Malawi, and, uh, and in name of the African Union, was a big supporter of this idea, but it was not enough. And so, so far, this idea hasn't in any way been implemented. But my, uh, my, my view is that uh, we, in our domain of uh, knowledge and uh, skill, have to provide what we can do for this kind of problem, not doing things we don't know about, and that's not our job to have expertise on energy or things like this, but we have expertise on how to finance big things in the long term, and that's what we, we try to do. Okay, I think given your schedule and... Uh, see the looks of some of your staff. It's uh, time to thank the managing director for his wonderful address to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Good. Thank you.